when we start thinking through church life, and we start thinking about what, what is church life? What is the mission of the church? Th- there has to be purpose to all this, right? Like we don't just gather and hear great music and see a good-looking preacher and go home and think, well, we've done it all. That, that's, that's, not, that's not the purpose of the church. Um, the, the church has a purpose. Look at your neighbor and say, we have purpose. Our purpose is unique. In fact, do you know this? If you've been with us for the last six months as we've, we've walked through the book of Acts, what you understand is the church became the hands and feet of Jesus. And, and so a, as we act like we're supposed to, the Bible says, let the redeemed say so. When we act like we're supposed to, we are really showing people who Jesus is is not only by our words, but our actions. My granddad always said, your actions speak louder than your words. What you do proves what you believe more than what you say. What you do proves what you really believe more than what you say. And so the church has to be the church. We we have to begin to, to function like we know Jesus. So we've been on this journey now for, for six months, and I think we've got about six more, but we'll eventually get to Acts 29. Um, we're just not going to be there today. The mission of the church is so unique, and it's, so, it's such a beautiful thing. And why I love the church, I, I, th- there are guys who go through seminary, and th- th- they get to that, that point, and they're at the end of their graduate level, and they, they make decisions on PhD work and that kind of stuff. And, and a lot of guys do that, and they think, I just want to go be a professor and teach. And, and I've never had that desire. I, I, I've never wanted to be on the academic side of what I do. I've always been a church guy. I love the church. And, and and the church is messy. The church, if you don't know this, you're a mess. If you haven't been told that today, let me go ahead and help you. You are a mess. And so you make messy things. The byproduct of people who are a mess, they make messy things. So when we gather in here, we're a bunch of God's messy people who have gathered under the banner of Jesus Christ. And the nucleus of what we do is not in our worship. It is not in our seats and it's not in our building. The nucleus of what we do and the nucleus of who we are is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And we exist to make him famous, to make his name known, and we want to partner with the Holy Spirit in bringing forth his will. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. It's not to dress up, look good, and come in and sing good songs, right? We're here to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Everybody hold up your right hand. I want you to say, God, this is your hand. Hold up your left hand. I want you to say, God, this is your hand. I want you to look at your feet. You didn't know this was Simon Says this morning. I want, you to, I want you to say out loud, God, these are your feet. And I want you to say this, God, whatever you need me to do, I will be faithful. Amen. Grab your Bible. Acts chapter 11, we're going to be reading a lot today and we're going to bounce through the next three chapters this morning, so I just need you to hang with me, buckle up, and we'll get out before the Methodists, I promise, okay? Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 19, says this, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, as far as Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Serene, who were coming to Antioch, and they spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. So in case you didn't catch that biblical language, this is what's happening. The the people of God are scattered. You remember about five chapters back when they stoned Stephen. They hit him with rocks because he refused to stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says that in that moment, the temperature gauge on those evangelicals got turned up and the disciples fled. Now they're going into these parts and, and those great Jews were only looking for Jews to share the gospel with and it says that there were men who came up from the south who began preaching what does it say 
preaching the Lord Jesus to the Hellenists, to the Jews. We're, we're preaching to the Greeks and to the Jews. We're preaching to everyone who has ears, and we're telling them about the Lord Jesus. That's where we're at. And the hand of the Lord was with them. Isn't that good news? Don't you wish, God, don't you wish you, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believe turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came, he saw the grace of God, and he was glad, and he exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to, to Tarsus to look for a man named Saul. And when they found him, they brought him to Antioch for a whole year. And they met with the church. And they taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, in those days, prophets came out of Jerusalem to Antioch, one of them named Agabus. If, if I have another son, I've decided Agabus is just a really cool name. Agabus stood and he foretold by the spirit that would be great, there would be a great famine over all the world, and this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his own ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So we get a beautiful picture of the church beginning to act like the church. Let's pray. Father, I am aware today that life is but a vapor and a mist here today and gone tomorrow. I do bend my heart, bend my spirit to the Baileys and the Davises this morning. I, God, I pray for, for Jenny and Caroline, and I just I weep with them losing their mom this morning. God, I pray that we would be the church they need us to be as we walk through this process. God, I pray for a mom and dad who are living out the worst nightmare they could live. God, I pray that those who are in our congregation that have walked similar journeys could show love and grace and support to them. Lord, I pray over your word. I'm thankful for Acts chapter 11. I'm thankful for just the picture of, of the church beginning to act like the church and, and how you've ordained all of this, even down to this morning, even down to this message. It's all from you. It's all for you. It's all for your glory. It's all for the redeeming act that you wish to pursue upon us. God, it's all about you. We are here today to confess with our hearts and with our mouths that our lives are about you. Forgive us when we make it about other things. God, bless the reading of your word. May it find a resting place in our souls, in our brains, and on our tongues. May we be like the people who came up preaching to the Hellenists about the Lord Jesus Christ. May the message of the gospel be constantly on our tongues. Father, thank you for your redemption. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your sanctification. Thank you that one day we will be complete in the glorification as we enter into your presence. It's in the name of Christ I pray and believe. And all God's people said, amen. So as the church begins to act like the church, one of the foundational elements of the church is the need for effective evangelism. Evangelism is something that, that we, we begin to say this is a program, and, and evangelism is not a program. Evangelism is a lifestyle. Evangelism is not a program. It's a lifestyle. So this year, we've challenged you as a church to have 2019 gospel conversations. We've challenged our staff that works here to be the front runners in this thing. Every time we meet as a staff, the very first thing we go over is how many gospel conversations did you have? How many times did you share the gospel this week? Who were they? Tell me the stories. And we're not just doing that so we can pat our backs and say, look how awesome we are. We're doing that because the, the Bible calls us to be evangelists. Everyone under the sound of my voice, you have been called to share the gospel. You know what will what, get on your nerves? Me and Pastor Jim have actually talked about this. Uh, there are guys out there who are fruit pickers. You know what I'm talking about when I say a fruit picker? When it comes to evangelism, 
I will have 30 gospel conversations and see one person saved. I've got a buddy of mine, if he has a gospel conversation, somebody gets saved. In fact, he had a gospel conversation with a guy that I had a gospel conversation with, and that brother got saved. And, and, I, and I, I congratulated him. I, I was excited. But at the same time, I wanted to know why him and not me. Is he sharing the gospel better? Some people, God just gifts that you are a fruit, but when you walk by, fruit's just jumping in the basket. People getting saved everywhere you go. I'm not that way. I'm not gifted at that level, but that does not mean that I stop sharing the gospel because what that means is I'm a fertilizer. I'm a seed caster. They may not get saved every time that I walk in the room, but they're going to hear the gospel and I'm going to share it. It's going to be the words on my tongue. We're going to have gospel-centered conversations. It's what we are as a church. We share the story of Jesus. And it's getting to be an old story, but it's as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. It's as powerful today as it was 2,000 years ago. We need effective evangelism. So what does that look like? That means we need a, a cultural engagement mentality. We need to look at our city not as our home, but our mission field. We don't need to drive through our town and go look at how great our city is look at how awesome this high school is winning championships like it's nobody's business we need to ride through our city looking for lost people not celebrating our home you ever notice how easy it is to lose the vision of god in your hometown nobody all right it's like this ladies let me ask you a question the man you've just been in trouble that honey to-do list that you've got for your husband. Have you ever looked at that and go, some of that stuff's been on the list for 15 years? You ever, you ever done that? Like, I've got something in my house, it's a unfinished product, and when my wife asks me about it, I, I tell her, it's under advisement. That's my excuse for it, it's under advisement. We're working on it. But th there's, a, there's a piece of cord around that, that I didn't cut just right, and it looks kind of ugly, and, I, and I've got to go fix it, and, and that's not really a big deal, but, but I said I was going to do it, and I told her I was going to do it, and it's been three years. Been three years, and it's still not cut. It's still not cut. It's still not fixed because when you see it every day, you begin to lose focus on it. It doesn't bother you anymore, right? Like there's times if I walk into your house, I'll be pointing out issues everywhere because I don't live there. You walk into my house and you say, well, Jeff, what about that? And I'll say, what about what? I don't see it. I see it every day. I don't see it. Well, ladies, it's not our fault. We just don't see it anymore. It's kind of like the socks that you step over. And Katie's like, did you just step over that pair of socks? Why did you not pick them up? And I'll say, I didn't see them. I didn't see them. I wasn't looking for them. It, it's not that I'm blind. I have great vision. It's just I wasn't looking for it. A lot of times in our city, we begin to have tunnel vision about where we live and where we're going and what we're doing. And, and Satan will get us so busy chasing our tails that we don't even notice our neighbors. One of the greatest tragedies of our modern generation is that we quit be building front porches. Some of you remember a day when you had, everybody had front porches on the house and when people would come in, that's where you went. You went to the front porch. And you sat on the front porch and you waved at your neighbors, you had conversations, you knew each other. How much, how often do you speak to your neighbors now? How well do you know your neighbors? We need a cultural engagement mentality, but we need gospel precision. We need gospel precision. We've got some great men in, in, our, in our room this morning who served in the military. I, I, I think um, my brother Mickey in the back, he's a good Baptist. He's all the way in the back today. Uh, brother Mickey um, is one of the best shots I've ever seen in my life. Love that brother. Um, that's what he did in the military. He, he could shoot just lights out. In fact, if you make him mad, you better get outside of 500 yards. That's all I'm telling you. Um, there, there's something special about it. Someone, an archer or someone who can fire with precision. They're, they're, they've got zoned in and they realize what their target is and they realize how to achieve that. When we start talking about gospel precision, we need to have the gospel and the full gospel and the biblical gospel, not this man-made business, not this prosperity gospel that says God wants you happy, healthy, and wealthy. Because if you believe God's about your health and your wealth and your prosperity, my friend, you're going to have a real big issue 
issue with the Bible. And if you think God's about to bootstraps, I mean, help myself, then you don't understand grace. We talking about the gospel where God came to save sinners and I am of the utmost. We're talking about the gospel where God wants to radically change our world by his presence, not our ideologies. We're talking about the gospel which lost people can be found dead and cr- dead in this world can be raised to life in Christ. We're talking about a gospel that brings forth sight, that brings forth life, and brings forth restitution. We're talking about a gospel in which we can be made right with God. That's the gospel that we must have precise and use with precision. The people around you, the people you go to work with, the people you go to school with, the people that you live next to need to hear the gospel. You say, well, Jeff, what if they're already saved? Tell them the gospel. You know, I never get tired of hearing the gospel. Somebody had a gospel conversation with me. I just imagine somewhere on a church sign somewhere, they've noted somebody had a gospel conversation and it was with me. They had it with me and I didn't get mad. I didn't punch them not one time. I heard the gospel and you know what it did? It fired me up. She was telling me the gospel like I'd never heard it. And she was telling me how there was a God who loved me. There was a God who wanted a relationship with me. And if I would repent from my sin and I would follow after him, I would be made new. And I was hearing this and I was getting fired up. And she said, are you ready to receive Christ? And I almost said yes, because she made it sound so good. But I tell her, ma'am, I'm already saved. I've been redeemed. She said, then why did you let me go this far? And I said, I wanted to make sure you had it right. I want to make sure you had it right. It's the gospel. It's the best news we've ever heard. It's the greatest news that's ever been told. And yet it's the message that's not being told. We need the gospel. We need to use it with precision. We need a humbled lifestyle. In the world that promotes you above everything else, in the world that says life is about you, in the world that says you need more of you in your life, if it feels good, do it, in the world that says that if it makes you happy, get after it, in that world, we need evangelicals, we need Christians to be humbled. Why? Because if we humble ourselves, we will magnify the name of Jesus. If we humble ourselves, we will magnify the name of Jesus. We'll make this life about him, about his glory, about his name, about his purpose. We'll make it about his salvation, about his redemption, his glorification. We'll make it all about him and not about me. We need a humbled lifestyle and then we need to recognize the Lord's favor. We need to recognize the Lord's favor. I love this. So the gospel comes to the Hellenists and people are are getting saved. The Bible tells us that as they began to preach, it says many were added, a great number believed in verse 21. It says it got out so much that a report got sent to Jerusalem. You don't know how much it would bless my heart if a report got sent out from Pinson, Alabama, that folks are being saved by the hundreds. Folks are being radically redeemed by Jesus. The whole city's getting different. It says that Jerusalem hears this. They send help they send back up they send people and when they get down there and they see what's going on they hear what's going on they're excited because they have found what god is doing and they want to be in on it they're not trying to they're not trying to artificially make the holy spirit we're not you, we don't use fog machines around here we want to be where god is we're not trying to manufacture that we want to be where he is it's evident where god is And where someone's trying to manufacture the Holy Spirit. We want to be where God is. We want to be a part of the work of the Holy Spirit. We want to be a part of the work of the Savior. We don't want to be trying to manufacture that. We want to be in His will. So the church needs effective evangelism. But it also needs a dynamic discipleship. How do we get where we are? How did we go from the book of Acts where the church is just on fire? Thousands and thousands and thousands are recorded of coming to faith and repentance. How did we get to where we're at today where the average church member is nominal at best, marginal at best? How did we get here? Somewhere along the lines, the process of discipleship broke down. The process of discipleship broke down. A church just can't have evangelism. They must have evangelism and a dynamic discipleship. You know, that's why we made one of our visions to disciple people. Notice in our vision, this is what we've played out. We want to see people 
have gospel conversations. That's called evangelism. But we weren't just happy with seeing them saved and baptized. We wanted to teach them. Let's, let's look and just keep reading what happens. So they, they call for a guy named Saul of Tarsus in verse 25. So Barnabas went to get Saul of Tarsus and he came and he found him and he brought him to Antioch for a whole year and he met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. To think you can do this life without discipleship is a tragedy. To think you can live this life without people investing in you for the, with the gospel is heresy. We need the gospel taught to us in ways that we understand it. The apostle Paul, one of the smartest dudes in the New Testament, one of the smartest guys in the New Testament outside of the person of Jesus, he knows the Bible. He, he's got the Old Testament. He knew Isaiah 53. And yet they go get him and they bring him to Antioch because they want him to be discipled. They want him to be discipled. So they began teaching him about Jesus. They began teaching him about the Messiah, about all that Jesus had taught. Remember, this is the Great Commission. He says, I've given you all authority on heaven and earth. Go ye therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Go get them saved, and then let's teach them all. Go get them saved, let's teach them all. At this point, Saul is learning about the all. He's learning about all that Jesus had commanded. So we need a dynamic discipleship, and that means we need accountability. We need accountability in our church. We need people who are accountable to the church as I am accountable to you. Accountability is the groundwork and the framework at which we flourish. It, it is... The groundwork and the framework at which we flourish. Discipleship apart from accountability isn't discipleship. You're just having coffee. We need accountability that we're going to walk in the presence of the Lord. And when we get off that narrow, this is why the Bible says that believers are accountable to one another. And when we see a brother go wayward, we go with him and get him back. When we see a, a sister go wayward, we walk with her and restore her. When we see that happen, we're, we're accountable to one another. And for discipleship, we must be accountable, but we also must be an encouragement. The world needs encouragement. One of the second things we ask in staff meeting, um, every one of your ministers at this church, on our staff, they must have gospel conversations every week and they must have encouragement every week. They need to be investing in a member every single week. We talk about it in staff meeting. Who did you share the gospel with? Who did you encourage? Every week this happens. We want to be a church that's encouraging. If you're walking through the mully grubs, we want to be your lifeline. If you're struggling in life, we want you to find hope here. If you need a hand, we'll offer a hand. If you need a hug, we'll offer a hug. If you need somebody to sit and cry with you, we've got people who can do that. If you're having a hard day, you're not alone. You're not alone. I've said this a hundred times. I don't see how people get by without the church. I don't see how people get by. When I see people living life at their worst, in their worst moments, I don't see how they do it without the church. I love that in the depths of my weakness, you stand here. In the depth where, where I can't, you can. And that's what makes the church such a beautiful thing. The church should be, should be encouraging, but, but also we should have good instruction. You see, part of discipleship is instructing. We, we, we need to be instructing on what the Bible says. We give instruction. This is how we live a biblical lifestyle. Do you know a biblical lifestyle is counterintuitive to a worldly lifestyle? One person knew that. I'll say it again. You weren't ready. You didn't know it was a pop quiz. Do you know a biblical lifestyle is counterintuitive to a worldly lifestyle? That means where the world goes, that doesn't necessarily mean a believer goes. What the world agrees to, the believers may, may not. If it stands to compromise the word of God, we don't step there. If it stands to compromise what God has said, we don't go there. We never look at the Bible and go, this is what the Bible says, but. There, there is no but in that conversation. It's this is what the word of God says. That's it. 
I, I agree, I, I believe, I've put my hope in Jesus and he gave me his word and I know that this is the authority of my life. This book is more important than a constitution. This book is more important than a 10 step help book. This book will bring life and this book lets me know Jesus. Therefore, this is the authority of my life. We instruct people in how to live in a biblical way. We don't want you looking like the world. The Bible says you're set apart. You're set apart. That means you don't look like the rest. You don't look like the rest. I've got clothes. You got church clothes? You got church clothes? Everybody's got church clothes, right? If you don't have church clothes, that's okay. You don't have to. We've got church clothes in our house, especially with our kids. Clothes that you wear to church on Sunday, and as soon as you get home from church, guess what? You come out of them. Because I've got two that'll destroy church clothes quicker than any other clothes. Be just nasty. Be out there in the dirt. We set the good apart. And we say, this is, this is reserved. As a believer in Christ, the Bible says you have been set apart You've been called out of the mass. You've been called out of the big group. Now you're over here and you're set apart and they're going to look at you. They're going to see you and they're constantly going to be judging you. Remember, the Bible doesn't have the authority on a lost person if they don't adhere to the promise of the scriptures. So a lost person has no issue in judging you. The Bible calls us not to judge back. Calls us not to judge to judge back. So we give instruction, and then we begin to watch fruit. Like I said, I've got a buddy of mine, and when he shares the gospel, people get saved. It'll almost drive you nuts. I'm, I'm proud. I'm glad he has that gift. But I sure wish I had it too. Sure wish I, I mean, he, he will go to someone I've had a gospel conversation with six times. Go to him and just very simply, hey, I think you need to get saved. And you're like, okay. I said, I said that yesterday. But God gives people that blessing and gives people that gift. You see, when we start discipling in a dynamic, intentional way, we will begin to see the fruit of discipleship. And the fruit of discipleship is that very, those very things we just went through. It's accountability. When you start getting sold out to who Jesus is, you will be accountable. You'll want to be a part of the bride. You'll want to be a part of the church. And, and you will be accountable. You'll be an encourager. You'll be an instructor. You, do you know we need more teachers? We need people who can stand up and lead. We need, we need men and we need women who, who can walk in the godliness way and who can walk in, in encouragement. We need those people. We need those, those children of God to stand up and, and to act like they have been matured in the gospel. We need that. And this is the function of the church. But also, the church needs mercy ministry. Look at verse 27 with me. It said, now, in those days, a prophet came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus, again, great name, stood, and he foretold, by the Spirit, there'd be a great famine over all the world. And this actually took place in the day of Claudius. And it says, the disciples were determined that everyone, according to his ability, would send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did, and they sent it by the elders, by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. The church has to be selfless. A, a church willing to love people isn't a church. A church not willing to love people, they're, they're not a church. Part of the gospel, we love God and we love people. It's the greatest commandment. We love God and we love people people we must love people that that means we're we're selfless that means we're generous we don't we don't look at our pocketbooks and, and go oh i can't do that i was gonna buy a corvette after church if i do that i can't no we're, we're generous because we understand every dollar that god has blessed us with every bite of food that the lord has allowed us to eat is by his hand and by his grace so we don't look at what God has given us and do like the little kid that, that used to be on the playground and take his ball and go home. We're gracious with what the Lord has given to us. So we give to the needy. We give to the least of these. We, we give to those who are in need and those who are hurting. We walk beside them and we're generous with what we have. Why? Because God has been generous to us. God has been generous to us, and we are ambassadors to him. 
the church is also a, a corporate thing. You know what I love about the church being corporate? You see, the church is only the church when we're here. This place operates as a business when you're not here. It's the business of Palmerdale Cross. We get bills just like you do at your house. The, the, the name on the sign says church, but it's only the church when you're here. It's only the church when you're here. It's just a building when you're not. It's the church when you're here. And when you leave, guess what happens? The church leaves. And it's a building. Now, yes, we set it apart and we pray. And this is our place of worship. But it's just, it's just wood and it's just metal. And, it, and it's just drywall and paint and lights and sound. That's it. it it's something we can replace um, the way our county works in three years if we needed to. It's something that we could replace. You are the church. And, and in mercy ministry, you are the hands and the feet of God. That means when you go out and you're generous, you're not only representing this church, you're representing Jesus. When you give to the poor, you're not only representing this church, you're representing Jesus. The world needs to see us corporately getting out, corporately leaving, and go in and be the church. Number four, turn over to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, one page over. Starting in verse 1, it says, it says, Now they were in the church of Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, the Cyrenian, Menonin, a long-term friend of Herod the Tetriarch, or Tetriarch, depending on how you want to say that word, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the, and fasting, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. So you get this picture where these men are gathered. And what I love about when you do some, some textual study of this passage these men were as far apart as sea to shining sea. These men were Jews, and they were Greeks, and they were South Africans. And they're there, and they're gathered, and they don't look alike by their flesh. They don't look alike by their hair. They don't look alike by their speech, and yet they're gathered. And in the midst of their diversity, listen to this, in the midst of their diversity, they are unified in purpose. In the midst of their diversity, they are unified in purpose. They have every skin color to man mentioned right here. And what are they doing together? They're praying and they're fasting. They're praying to God Almighty and they're fasting. Why? Because they realize what's at hand. You see, this is the part where they begin to pray before the Lord sends Paul out on a missionary journey. This is the part where the Holy Spirit selects Saul and Barnabas, selects these two men. How did they decide to be some of the greatest church planners of our time? It wasn't by circumstance. It happened through prayer and fasting. And it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas who saw this and experienced this. These other men from corners of the globe hear the call See what God is doing. And it says that after, after they heard God say, set apart these two, they began to pray and support. They began to pray in the support. And that means for us to be the church, we must, we must be about the mission of God and we must send out missionaries. We must send out missionaries. We used to live in a day though when we'd have to get on an airplane and ride 14 hours to find a host of lost people. Can I tell you that for the first time since the 1600s, we're now receiving missionaries faster than we're sending them out. Other countries are sending missionaries to the United States of America to come do missions here. We need to send missionaries. We need to send them to Fawcett Road. We need to send them to Highway 75. We need to send them to Rimlap. We need to send them to Centerpoint. We need to send them to Birmingham. 
You don't have to get on an airplane and travel the globe to find lost people, my friend. They're in our backyard. They eat at the restaurants we're fixing to eat at. They shop at the grocery stores we shop at. They go to the same gas stations we go to. We don't have to go look for them. They're right here with us. They come into your store. They come into your place of business. You interact with them every single day. But notice how this transaction happened. Notice that worship and prayer fueled the mission. How do we get ready to go change our world? Through worship and prayer. Through worship and prayer. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Have you caught that through this book? The people who went and did a great work of God, they weren't extra special. They were really extraordinary. Normal guys, normal people doing extraordinary things because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Number B, spirit, the Spirit leads and the congregation follows in this endeavor. The Spirit leads and the congregation follows. So when I tell you, we're not trying to manufacture Holy Spirit movements. We're not trying to make up or, or, or somehow create a movement of the Holy Spirit. We want to be receptive to what God is already doing. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a will. And it's the world being turned in repentance back to him. We don't have to manufacture that. We find where the Spirit's moving and we go there. See, we recognize we're all called, we're all set apart, and we must be faithful to the Spirit. We're all called. We're all called to go make disciples. Not one person in the Bible, not one person in the Scriptures heard that passage out of Matthew and said, well, that doesn't apply to me. They all heard it and said, yes, Lord, I'm faithful. Yes, Lord, I'll go. Yes, Lord, send me. Jesus told the disciples, he says, the harvest, the fields, they're white with harvest. They're ready to be plucked. It's now. It's now. You don't have to wait on a day when people are going to get ready. People are ready now to hear the gospel. They're ready now to see the church act like the church. They're ready now to experience the forgiveness that Christ offers by way of salvation. Can I ask you today, are you ready to take it to them? Here's what I'm convinced of. You can't give away what you don't have. You cannot give away what you don't have. So you can't go give away the gospel if it's never impacted your life. In fact, you won't, not for long anyway. You need Jesus in your heart. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I can't do that for you. Like, don't come up in our prayer time saying, Jeff, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I can't. I mean, I've hit people before over the head and nothing happened except they got mad at me. I, how do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? In the Bible, it says they worshiped, they prayed, they fasted. They spent time with God. They talk to God and they discipline their lives for faithfulness. What are you doing to make a difference? How is your life looking like the church? And how are you living out the mission of the church in your everyday life? What we don't need in our life is more Sunday morning heroes. You know what I'm talking about? When you put on that, those dress clothes, all of a sudden you're sanctified. The world needs you sanctified on Monday morning. The, church, the world needs you sanctified on Friday night, on Saturday evening. The church needs you sanctified when you're in traffic. The, the world needs you sanctified when you're eating lunch, when you're pumping gas next to someone and you've got them tied down for three minutes, depending on where you're at, maybe a little longer. The world needs you sanctified, set apart, prayed up, and ready for the mission of Jesus Christ. Are you ready for that? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you designed the church. You created this thing. It, it wasn't by happenstance and it wasn't an accident. You created the church to be your hands and your feet. Not only did you create it, but you empowered it by the Holy Spirit. So, Father, I pray 
for the masses of people who hear my voice. God, I pray that they would be encouraged today to live like Jesus, to live like they've been called, to live like they've been redeemed. God, if they've never accepted you, they know they got a spiritual problem, that they know they need Jesus, they know they need the gospel, that they need to hear about how you came to save sinners. And so, God, I, I pray that they would find salvation this morning. Give them, give them the boldness to stand up and step out and say, I need to come hear about Jesus. Can you tell me about Jesus? Give them that, give them that boldness today. Father, for the rest who, who have just become lazy, who just become so, so entangled with the sin of busyness that we've missed our calling. God, I pray and I beg that they will find repentance, but also they will find a sense of joy when they get faithful before you. God, I pray that our city becomes our greatest mission field. I pray for the people who are around our church within five miles of our church. God, I pray that even now they're feeling a tugging on their heart, that your Holy Spirit is already softening their soul, ready to receive the gospel. God, I pray that our church would be faithful with the message you've given us. Father, we long for a movement of the Holy Spirit. We long to see lives transformed and redeemed. We pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. If, if you want to join our church, if you want to get saved, if you want to come.